Welcome back to church, guys. As you're wrapping up your conversation, and I'm getting set up here, let me just take a moment to welcome you again. I'm so excited to be sharing installment number two of Circles. It's time that our church turns in toward one another, and we are so excited um, that you decided to come and be a part of this. How many of you, be honest with me, um, how many of you were here last week? Let's start with that. How many, how many of you were uh, a little uncomfortable when you walked in? Be honest. Okay, there's a few of you. So let's just give it up for our introverts for sticking with us. <laughs> Because we love you. Introverts are amazing. I married one, and she's the only thing that keeps our house sane. And so that's why God gave us introverts. But thank you so much for recognizing that community is important for everyone, right? All different temper temperaments. We need community, and I'm so excited to share with you what's on my heart today. So we are doing this, a very physical thing, to teach us something very important, that Discipleship happens in community. Growth happens in circles and not rows. We're in circles this morning because something powerful happens when we turn in toward one another. We're in circles this morning because we were created for community, as we discussed last week. And not only that, but when we turn in toward one another, we're reflecting the character of our God, our Creator, which is three in one, that He Himself exists inside community. And how silly for us to think that we can get along without community. But not just, just this isn't just a song, that song, right? Like, you gotta have friends, right? It's not about that, right? It, yeah, yes, we always like, duh, Joe, we know we need friends, but no, 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 you need biblical community. You need a church that's more than just a great church. You need a church that's family. How many of you wanna be a part of a church that just feels like family? I hope that you already feel that, and if you don't, man, I am praying hard that that shift in culture changes here and that shift in your heart changes here so that you truly feel connected at the fountain. But we turn toward each other because amazing things happen when people come together amazing things. There's something amazing about seeing what people can accomplish when they come together. I think that that's a reason why a lot of us like sports, okay? I'm a football guy, but I have to tell you, um, I was really impressed watching Olympic volleyball. And uh, it, it, what is crazy about that is how in sync the team is. And see, see the defense is so good that the only way the offense can score is not just by having this really tall person that can just slam the ball on the other side. Because I've seen that happen time and time again, and they will dive, and maybe it's just getting a hand underneath the ball. It saves it from hitting the ground. They get it up, and then they hit back the other way. And sometimes the other team scores because it looks like the other team is like, oh yeah, as soon as he hits that, that's a point. And so they're not ready back on defense. The other team scores. But what is crazy is to generate more offense the way that they will set the ball up in the air. One person will jump and swing and purposely miss as the ball soars past them, and then the second person will hit it. And it's just so perfectly timed, and I walked away from that just being amazed at just how of one mind they would have had to be to pull that off. Um, it's, it's not even like football where you get to, you know, huddle up and make sure everybody knows what they're doing, right? And then, and then you line up and you get to be thinking about your assignment as you're lining up. It is just go, 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 go. And they're running these plays and it's nonstop action. Have you ever been that boy that's really mean and nasty? Oh, maybe some girls did it too, but I feel like it's a boy thing where you walk up to this enormous anthill, right? And what do you do to it? You just kick that thing over. And why do you do that? Because if you've ever done that, well, because you're mean, but besides that, if you've ever done that before, what happens to those ants? Somebody said they die? That's so dramatic. Justin, they don't die, not unless you step on them. No, what do they do? They start building that anthill all over again, like immediately. And it's crazy. You watch them, and, and they start moving really, really fast. I used to think they were just really angry, uh, but I think what they're doing is they're just hurrying to rebuild uh, their home. And what they're able to accomplish is crazy. You can sit there and in a few minutes you can watch this thing start to take shape again and it is just incredible how you can knock it over again and what are they gonna do? I've never seen an ant go, forget this, and walk off, right? They just 
keep at it. Can you imagine if a church had that mentality, right? Where like anytime something went wrong in your church, instead of saying, forget this, I'm out of here, you're like, no, I'm gonna fix this. I'm gonna work on my relationships here. I'm gonna fit this, I'm gonna fix uh, the community that's broken within my circle. Amazing, just the, the tenacity of ants. And you could say, well, Joe, they don't have brains. Like it's just instinct, okay? That's great. We need to be, we need to have smaller brains as a church. We really do. I'm kidding. But it's amazing. And the reason why they're able to accomplish this is because they're focused on one sole purpose. Have you noticed that when uh, uh, the situation demands for us to focus on one thing, we rise to the challenge as people? Like if it's a matter of survival, there's not going to be any quarreling over stupid, silly things, right? It's like we have to get this and we have to come together. We're all focused on surviving or we're all focused on the goal at hand. And what happens right? Is everybody in this room, let's say I put a target on the wall and I said, your goal is to go from this side of the room and touch that target. Where are we all going to end up? At the target together in close proximity because we cannot touch the target without rubbing shoulders with the rest of those that are heading the same direction. My prayer for us today is that we could have this type of uh, unwavering focus on being the church to one another on loving our neighbor as ourself. Because if we can do that, then incredible things can happen. So why are those ants so determined to rebuild? Because without their home, the the colony will not survive. Without their home, they will die. They have a responsibility and they're focused on that. So no matter how many times the nasty mean boy kicks it over, they're gonna keep rebuilding. Church, you need to understand that there is an enemy at work in this church. Am I giving him, you know, too much credit? Am I saying, oh no, let's run and hide? No, but there is an enemy at work in this church and he wants to destroy this house. He wants to destroy our community because he knows that if he can mess up our relationships, then the church will not survive because the church is not a building, is it? I said, the church is not a building, is it? The church is a people. The church is a family. The church is the body of Christ. So church, I want to challenge you this morning. Let's build something together. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, praise God. I don't have a Bible, so that's weird. I'm going to read it off the screen, David, so if you could put it up there. This is what happens when I'm doing worship and stuff. It's just like, whoo, crazy. All right, so we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 today. We're just going to be looking at verses 11 through 16. And in this tiny little passage, it says so much about community that I think if we will hear it and we will listen to the Spirit speak, it's going to do incredible things for us. So here we go, starting at verse 11. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Verse 12, the responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. That's a high standard, isn't it? Then we will no longer be immature like children. The parents just... Take a moment to sigh. You know what we're talking about. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Have we encountered that in this day and age? I have to admit, I've, I've been duped a couple times. Like, that sounds right. And then you hear the other side, nope, that doesn't sound right at all. Instead, it says, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. How many of you would like to be a part of a church that is healthy and growing and full of love? And Paul gives us a plan in this passage. He's basically saying, do this, and this will be the result. See, a key verse here, what I want to focus on is verse 12. 
where it says the responsi- their responsibility, the pastors, teachers, evangelists, all that, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So let me give you a little background on the, the letter to the church in Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, as we call it. Paul wrote this letter to the church of Ephesians. And unlike many of his other letters that were addressing church drama, right? Like there's something messed up going on in Corinth. So I'm going to write this letter about this craziness, about this dude who like took his father's wife, which is really creepy and gross, right? We, we talk about that's easy for us to condemn this day and age, right? That's one thing I think most of us can agree on, that, that that's probably not right. And, and he writes this letter to correct the behavior and be like, what's going on in the church? You guys need to shape up. Ephesians is a little bit different. This is his, as I started out last week, and I started talking about how I see a church that, and we filled in the blank, right? I see a church that, and we filled in the blank. This is Paul's I see a church message. It's his rah-rah sermon. Because unlike his other letters, which dealt with church drama, this letter was written to inspire a church to become all they can become. So this morning, can we be a church that moves past the drama and focuses on what we are becoming? Are we a church that's ready to take that next step and say, let's become in the image of Christ? And so I want to introduce something to you because community builds. Verse 12 talks about having a responsibility to build, and community is the way that we build. See, community is so much more than something to enjoy. Like We all like to be a part of community. We all like to feel like we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. But community goes beyond that. Community is a part of God's creative process. So God didn't just create us, but he created us with the ability to create. So, I want to talk to you about five building blocks of community. Number one, this will be gratitude. We can build upon gratitude. Number two, ownership or responsibility. We take ownership of the mission. Number three, maturity, which some people would say that counts me out, but I'm working on it. Number four, strength. And number five, function. We have to be able to function as a church. So before we dive deeper into the scriptures here, we're going to take a moment to pause. And at your tables, I want you to discuss this question. What is the best thing you've ever created, built, or put together? So for some of you, you might be able to say something amazing like, I designed the building in downtown Phoenix, or I built the home that I live in. And if you're more like me, you'd be like, okay, the best thing I ever put together was an entertainment center from Walmart. But whatever it is, you're going to share your experience at your table. So let's take a few minutes to discuss. We'll cue the music, and you guys get to talking.
Hopefully, I'm not cutting you guys off too early, and I hope you've enjoyed your conversation uh, so far this morning. But we're going to transition into our first point of this morning. So, perfect. Awesome. So the first building block, as I mentioned, is gratitude. So we're going to call it this. You know what? We can't start with purple because it's like a long skinny one. So we'll say this one is gratitude. Okay? Gratitude. Why do I say gratitude? Take a look at verse 11 again. Verse 11, this is the first time that this, this verse has jumped out at me this way. And um, I want to encourage you guys to read your Bible a lot over and over again because you get so much out of it, something different every time. But I've always kind of skipped over verse 11 and, and, and maybe not skipped over, but focused on the gift of apostles, the gift of prophets, like of their actual gifts, right? But what it actually says is that these are people. So the gifts to the church are people. See, it doesn't say prophecy, it says prophets. It doesn't say evangelists, or it doesn't say evangelism, it says evangelists. It doesn't say uh, pastoring, but pastors. It doesn't say teaching, but teachers. That the gifts to the church are you and me, each other. And when someone gives, then you need to show gratitude. And that's why I believe that in order to have successful community, you have to have gratitude. You have to appreciate the people around you and appreciate the relationships that you have. So I love that the gift is a person and not just what the person can give. Maybe some of you have unfortunately been a part of a relationship where you felt like it was all about what you could give that other person and you felt like maybe they wanted something you had to offer instead of just wanting you as a person. But our God doesn't work that way and that is not the type of relationship he has envisioned for us to have uh, with one another. And even in John 3.16 we see this. For God so loved the world that he gave what? It doesn't say like he gave salvation. No, it says that he gave his only son because he understood that the son was the gift because it was only through a relationship with Jesus that you and I can be saved. And so the person sitting at the table with you is a gift. Can you just look at somebody right now, make long, awkward eye contact with that person and say, you are a gift. That's awesome. One of my favorite sayings is it's always awkward until it's not. And that's what we're doing. We're getting all the awkwardness out of the room so that we feel really connected. So leaders specifically are a gift that have been given to us by God. Let me just stop and say I am thankful for the leadership here at the fountain. I'm thankful for our elders. I'm thankful for our deacons that have served in the past. Can we just give it up for our leadership team at the fountain today? I'm thankful that a church is not run just by a pastor, but a church is ran by elders. I'm so glad that doesn't fall on me, and if you guys know any better, you're glad too. And so in verse 12, it mentions that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to equip each other to do the work that God has called us to do. And so the second building block is Ownership. I picked out the wrong shapes. Ownership. See, responsibility comes with every gift, does it not? I mean, let's be real. If I give you a gift, I'm giving it to you understanding you're free to do whatever you want with it. But if I give you a gift and you don't use it for what it was intended for, what am I going to think? That you undervalue it or you don't understand what you've been given? Or if I give you a gift and you abuse it and treat it poorly and it breaks then that's going to make me feel a certain kind of way and it might make me hesitate giving a gift or what I give you as a gift next time. So um, how many of you had this happen with your children before? Okay, so we have a lovely son and his name is Levi and I can still talk about him because he's too young to feel offended. And uh, Levi is awesome. He is a boy's boy, right? He loves trucks, monster trucks, race cars, motorcycles, race tracks, right? He loves all that stuff, but he doesn't just love to play with it. He is the kind of kid that wants to take everything apart. 
And so he loves to see how something works. And yeah, he loves to take things apart and put them back together. But how many of you know, often when a kid takes something apart, sometimes it can't be put back together because that piece wasn't supposed to come apart. And I just remember for his birthday, he got this really awesome gift. And it was a, it was a Super Mario Kart racetrack that I think was given to him by his uncle. And um, it was the coolest thing. And, and it was the actual characters in their carts. And how many of you grew up playing that game? Yes, 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 yes. So fun. And so this thing would actually propel them around over and over again. And so it wasn't an electric track all the way around, but there were these spinning wheels. And when the car would hit those wheels, it would shoot it out and give it enough momentum to go all the way around the track again. And it would just go. And I just thought that is the coolest thing in the whole world. And deep down, I'm thinking to myself, I want one too, right? And so my son enjoyed it for a few, ta- a few days, but that wasn't good enough for him. He needed to take it apart. And one day he came up to it and he says, I wonder what would happen if I bent this piece backwards and snap, it broke. So with experiences like that, I think twice about what I give my kids. First of all, how much money do I want to spend on this and how breakable is it? Right? Because I don't want to spend $100 on something knowing that my child's going to play with it for a day and destroy it. And so it makes me think twice about what types of gifts I will give to my kids moving forward. See, the way that they treat them makes me have second thoughts. And there's certain gifts that I truly want to give my kids. But I know they can't handle the responsibility. You know what I mean? Like a phone. Just saying. But take a moment with me and think about this. I wonder what gifts God has been wanting to give you if you were ready. I wonder what types of gifts the Lord would like to pour out upon this church if we knew that we were ready to receive them and use them for their proper purpose. Think about community for a moment. Is God going to bless this church with growth if we don't know how to care for one another when people show up? Perhaps he's waiting for us to mature to a certain point so that he can pour out his blessings and those blessings will not be wasted because with every gift comes a responsibility. See, living in real community unlocks the gifts of God upon our church and our community and yes, dare to believe and dream with me, our world. You know, back when they came out with the iPhone 7, and I know they're at like iPhone 57 right now, right? (laughs) But when they came out with the iPhone 57, they really wanted to focus on upgrading the camera. And they were so devoted to making the camera experience wonderful, amazing, high-tech, that they actually devoted 800 employees to work on that function of the phone alone. Can you imagine that? Assigning 800 people, not just to create the phone, but just the camera in the phone. And if we think about it, there are few things technology-wise that have shaped the world as much as the iPhone has, okay? I think the first iPhone came out in 2007, which to me doesn't seem that long ago, but when you look at how much more developed the iPhone is now, it's like 50 years ago, right? It's amazing how fast it has changed and evolved and how it has influenced the world. And so some would say, yes, it has changed it for the good. And some would say, that could be one of the worst things that has happened to society. And so no matter what side of the fence you are on, though, you see that the iPhone has truly had a powerful effect on our culture today. If you agree with me, lift up your hand. Let me hear you, okay? Because I, I hear hands go up. Sometimes, you know, it just comes out and then you're like, think about it afterwards. So what we're going to do is we're going to transition into our second question. I hope you guys are enjoying your conversation this morning. And again, for those of you that are watching online, we encourage you to participate with anyone you might be watching with. Um, If not, jot down your answers and you feel free to uh, write your answers in the comments. We would love to have an opportunity to share those um, in person, uh, live online. And so question number two is this. What is something we, like as a church, can build through community that could even change the world? You know, what is something that God wants the fountain to create together that could truly make an impact, okay? What is something we can build through community that can change the world? Let's discuss.
right. Well, I'm hearing some really great answers um, as I walk around the tables and hang out at this table over here. Um, so, let's get back to Ephesians chapter 4 and let's take a look at verse 13. So, in verse 12, it talks about responsibility, right? To equip God's people to do, to do His work. And, and then it says something in verse 13. It says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son. I love that it's painting this picture of like as this continues, like those first two verses, as that continues, there's a result that comes from that. We begin to move closer towards unity. This is what I was talking about earlier, the bullseye on the wall. As we remain in community, we get closer and closer if we are focused on the same goal and the same purpose. It says, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of God. Now, is Paul saying that if we continue in this, we will be perfect? No, but we are heading in that direction. We are becoming more and more like Christ as we remain in this type of community. So this isn't just something that happens because we're sitting in circles, is it? This isn't something that happens just because we gather together often. This is something that happens when we live in a certain type of community uh, where we live out the characteristics of Christ and the fruits of the Spirit, where we show each other love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness, and, and all those things. The result of that is we become more and more like Christ. But the goal is maturity. And so the third building block is maturity. Maturity is something that is required so that we can build. See, this process that Paul is describing only takes place within community. And so he's not giving us instructions for just self-discipline, right? And it, what's crazy is I think a lot of us grew up in church thinking that if I want to be a better Christian, I, gotta read, I just got to read my Bible more and I got to pray more. But there is a third uh, leg to that, which is having Christian community. And without that, it's like a three-legged stool with a missing leg. You can't sit on that or you're going to fall over. And so you can't function in God's will outside of community. And if you think about it, you'll see it that way. It just doesn't make sense. Have you ever had a child that is so well-behaved I could just stop there and be like, no, <laughs> right? But have you ever had a child that is so well-behaved as long as they're not around their other siblings? Is that maturity? Is that child even well-behaved because we keep them separated? I have the perfect child. He just can't be around people. <laughs> See, maturity cannot happen, right? Because it happens in community and it can't be seen or shown outside of community, you can't spell community without unity. You cannot become unified without maturing. And so community without maturity is shallow at best. It, you could say it's fake. It's not even real community. But community without maturity is shallow. And I've seen it so many times in the church that we step into it to a certain extent. We've got one foot in and one foot out. Or we step into it until we realize the waters are sometimes cold and we pull that foot right back out again, right? And then we back off. But see, the way God has designed us to grow and mature is within community. And so to step outside of that, to remove yourself from that or to not make an effort to connect yourself in that is to uproot yourself, from God's plan for your life. I've never seen a plant grow when it was ripped out of the dirt and it was just had exposed roots. It needs the soil to grow. So to not fully commit is like having a shallow root system. So I did a little research and I'm not sure if Felix is in here to correct me if I'm wrong, okay? But I did a little research on shallow root systems. And apparently this is a problem that is very common among the shade trees or landscape trees that you have in your yard, is that sometimes their root system is just a little bit too shallow. And so when a tree has a shallow root system, it can lead to problems with both the tree and its surroundings. So in my instance, we actually had to have Felix come over because the root system was so shallow that it began to lift up my brick wall. 
that goes around my backyard. And so there was a gap forming between one cinder block and the next. And of course, I didn't notice it, but my nice, kind neighbor complained to me that we were destroying her side of the wall as well. And so we had uh, Felix come out and dig that up and cut it out so that it was no longer damaging the wall. But on top of that, it can also, the tree itself can suffer from the topsoil becoming so hard and compacted from foot traffic or from lawnmowers. As you go over that lawn over and over and over again, it gets compacted down. If those um, roots are at that topsoil, it's so dense that they can't expand and grow and get the nutrients that that tree needs. And it leads to something that they call shade tree decline. And so here's a few of the symptoms. If you have a tree that has shade tree decline, fewer leaves develop on the tree. Um, leaves have become smaller than normal. Early leaf drop in the late summer instead of fall. Uh, premature fall color. Some of you guys are taking notes. Like, that's, my tree is having all those problems. <laughs> the tips of the branches begin to die back. Or small branches just die altogether and they don't survive. This is how you know your tree is in decline. You might see leaf scorch where there's the browning of the edges of the leaf. And the trees become more susceptible to other insects and disease problems. So check this out. When we are not rooted deep in community, we limit our capacity for growth and maturity. And we can often cause damage to those around us. We cause damage to our surroundings. Why? Because hurt people hurt people, don't they? Wounded people oftentimes lash out and create wounds in others. And see, the solution to your pain, the solution to the hurt that you carry is not to isolate yourself. All that is going to do is to form a callus that... Um, disables you from being the person you were created to be. And that hurt is going to resurface. All it takes is an encounter with the wrong person at the wrong time or a key word that for you is a trigger. To them, it's just a word, but for you, it's a trigger. And when they say it, it's, whoa! It's like that original pain is rising to the surface again. We have to be deeply rooted in community. I wonder if some of you have an example of how community has helped you heal. I wonder if some of you have an example of how the right relationships helped you get past a certain point or inspired you to become all that you could be. And so our last question of the morning is I just want to take a few minutes to discuss number three. How can deeply rooted community impact your spiritual life? How can you being rooted in deep community have a positive impact on your spiritual life. So let's discuss.
All right. Well, I hope you guys have had some great conversation uh, as we kind of move towards the conclusion of today's message. Would you look, take a look at verse 14 with me as we move on to the fourth building block of community. In verse 14, it says, if you do all these other things, basically, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Have you ever felt like, um, even if it's not like being deceived or believing in something that's not true, have you ever felt like you're blown and tossed about by whatever comes your way? I have. Where you just don't feel strong. Like you feel weak. You feel like um, that you're just a victim and stuff just happens to you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Am I the only one that's been in that situation? It's just like, man, I just, and, and so we just become victims of our own circumstances and we feel like we have no ability to rise out of it. Oftentimes it's community that helps us understand that we can, that we do have a choice, that there is a path. Um, that what does scripture say? That, that God will always provide a way out. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear and he will always provide a way out so that you can lift yourself up and stand up underneath it. And in verse 15, he says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. The fourth building block is strength. That as we grow, we will grow strong. And we need to be strong because we live in a real world, don't we? And we live where there is opposition around every corner, and we face a lot in life. Even in this blessed country of the United States of America, we face op opposition. We face challenges in work, in our social life, in our family on a regular basis. And it's, it's, it's crazy to me how people criticize Christianity or any other religion by calling it a crutch. Because to me, I'm like, dude, you need a crutch too. Like, we're just humble enough to admit it, right? And, and I've seen people crumble under the pressure when they try to do everything themselves. And some people are great leaders and some people are stronger than others. But ultimately, you were created to need others. We talked about that last week. God said it is not good for mankind to be alone. And so we were created with a deficiency. Think about that. Created without, without sin originally, right? But we were created with a deficiency that needed to be uh, accompanied. It needed to be complemented by someone else. And this is what Paul sees as the result of community done God's way. This is what is built when a church comes together in community. And I wonder, where did we get this idea that there was another way to do church? Where did we get this idea that there's a, a different way to have church? Guys, we have, we have to become so much more than a place. We must become a family. We are more than great music. We are more than a great sermon. If that's all we are, we might as well just stay home. And if I can be really honest, perhaps that is why so many people are staying home today across the country. Because their church is not an essential part of their community. The church has become nothing more than a great sermon, nothing more than great music and great worship, nothing more than flashy lights and, and nice facilities. But in reality, we were created with a need for community that only God's church can provide. I don't say that arrogantly. I don't say that to manipulate people to come back to church. I say that because that's what Jesus said. The church was Jesus' idea. He came up with us meeting together. We're here today because Jesus decided to build a church Church cannot just be a place. It has to be essential community. We were meant for so much more. I don't know about you guys, but I want to build something. Anybody ready to build something together here at the fountain? <laughs> Lastly, verse 16 says, He, Christ, makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own 
special work. Can you just look at somebody at your table and say, you have your own special work. <laughs> so as each part does its own special work, it says it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. The last building block we're going to call function. I was never good at Legos. That's why I asked for the preschool ones. That so you could see it as well. But something this does not show you is function, right? Because in reality, community is not blocks, is it? And because these cannot function, there's no movement, right? They're, they're stuck in place. They are stationary. But yet what we learn here that is that we grow into who we're supposed to become as we work and move together and do life together. See, community is not just simply finding where you fit and camping out there. Hey, these are my people right here. We, we like, over here we like to talk about sports and essential oils, right? And um, <laughs> inside joke for who's sitting at the table there, right? <laughs> right? Or over here, you know, we get to talk about uh, professional wrestling, right? Or uh, restoring old furniture. And so that's my people. So now that I find out where I belong, I'm just going to camp out here and we're just going to enjoy one another. How many of you think that that is all you need? I'm glad to see no hands shooting up because it's so much more than that. We were designed to function together. And so there is an idea in this passage that comes from this Greek word, which I can barely pronounce, but I'm going to try. It's like um, sunar molagio. It's probably wrong, but what it means is, um, in a sense, hinged together. And so this is from uh, the Helps Word Studies, um, and you can find this on BibleHub.com, by the way. It's a really awesome tool. God uh, fitly framing believers into a harmonious, synergistic whole. That is each individual being functioning as a part of the one people of God. I love how it says in quotations, it hinged together. Because something that's unique about a hinge is it can allow movement. Now, if you've ever seen a door hinge, you understand that that hinge can actually support a whole lot of weight. How many of you have ever had a really heavy door on your home? Like super, like solid wood door. Like, I love those houses that have those really tall, like heavy wood doors. They look so cool. But it's still just two hinges. Or is it three, Jonathan? Is it three? So it's three hinges, right? And they can support an enormous amount of weight, but yet it doesn't restrict their movement. And so those hinges are not going to come apart, right? But they're going to continue to be flexible and to move so that the door can what? Open and function. The door is able to function because the hinge is properly positioned and allowed to do what a hinge is supposed to do. See, we hold tightly to our unity, but we empower others to freely use their gifts. We must learn how to function like this together. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I pray that you would begin to help us learn how we can grow together in community, where it is that we fit, and how it is that we are supposed to function. Father, I thank you for these building blocks that you've taught us of gratitude. God, I pray that we would be thankful for one another and the relationships that we provide, for ownership, that we would rise up to the responsibility that I'm not here just to be here, but I'm here to fulfill my God-given purpose. Maturity, God, that we would rise above the, the little tricks that the enemy uses and the bait that Satan uses to trap us and destroy our community. God, for strength, that this church would be unshakable together as one so that we can accomplish what you've called us to do. And Father, that we would function in community. God, make us a church that functions together to accomplish your great purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's how we're going to close. So first off, before we close out in prayer at our tables, I want to encourage you to sign up for Rooted. 
Okay, and so you can sign up for Rooted on the app or the website. Here's what I love about Rooted. As we end talking about function, what I love about Rooted is there's a whole season of Rooted where you spend talking about the gifts that God has given you, the passions that he has given you, and the places in society he has positioned you. Because oftentimes when you find out where those three things intersect, you'll locate your purpose And it's a great, incredible journey where you go along this journey with other people in community. You serve together. You reach out to the community together. And so many times in that process, God paints a very clear picture about your purpose in your life. Our church is about connecting you with God, the church, and your purpose. And so we encourage you to sign up for Rooted if you have not done that already. So we are going to close out like we did last week. If you weren't here, um, each table host is going to close out their tables in prayer. And so this is an opportunity for you to share any prayer needs that you have with your group. Um, So there will be no hard dismissal today. In fact, you guys are welcome uh, to, uh, to hang out a little while. Um, and it was crazy last week. You guys blew my mind. Um, it was like 1230 and people were still talking around their tables. Don't let that intimidate you. You leave when you need to leave. But I love that you guys enjoy being around each other. Isn't that really cool? Very awesome. So before we do that, though, there's one more thing I want to do. I would like to have uh, Tom and Delmara come up here. And is uh, Juliet in the room or? Okay. Uh, it's up to you. You guys want to grab her real quick? Okay, so Tom, go ahead and come up here so we can at least look at your pretty face while she goes to get Juliet. Um, so um, I don't know how many of you know Tom and Delmara, but Tom and Delmara, come on, come up here with me. Um, they have been uh, a part of the fountain for like ever. Um, and even after they moved um, to Colorado, um, they always uh, felt like this is their home church still, right? Am I putting words in your mouth? No, not at all. And so when they would be back to visit, they'd often come and join us for church. And um, God has given them an opportunity to go on a pretty incredible journey. And so they have taken, what do they call that trailer again? It's called a what? Airstream. An Airstream trailer, right? So it, to me, it looks like a UFO. <laughs> like it's, just this, it's just like this can, right? That just like reflects the sun. And I'm sure it was fun working on that in the summer, wasn't it? Yeah. And so they renovated this whole thing from scratch. And so God has given them the opportunity. They're going to take their family on this adventure across the country. And so they'll be staying, what, for like weeks or months at a time, different places. Yeah. And so, so, so yeah, they'll find, yeah, and it, it, there's not even a plan, is there? They're just like, hey, let's stay here for a while, right? And so they get an opportunity to do this. And uh, we just want to bless them today because I believe that God is going to do incredible things through them, that he's got a purpose for this, that they're going to come, they're going to cross paths with people that they otherwise would not have, and they're going to have an opportunity to share the gospel, uh, to pray with people, to bless people, and I know that God is going to use this really amazing uh, journey to do his good work for them. So will you guys join me in prayer? Are the kiddos going to come up here? No? Not even Juliet? Oh, man, that's okay. You'll, you'll still receive the prayers. It'll still work, all right? All right, would you guys just kind of stretch your hand kind of this direction as we just pray? Father, thank you so much for uh, this incredible family. Father, I have personally been so blessed uh, by this amazing couple, uh, by having the opportunity to get to know Juliet this year and all of her sass and everything. God, she is a blessing, and uh, we have truly enjoyed her, honestly, and just the the relationship uh, that has been developed there, God, for what she adds to our group. We thank you, God, for the boys. God, we thank you that your, your hand is upon this entire family. And God, we just ask that you would go with them. God, that you would use them in a mighty way. And Father, that um, you would just uh, bring divine appointment after divine appointment, God, to be used by you on this journey. We thank you so much. We ask for your protection, uh, God, for your covering over them wherever they go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give it up for the Kristen family. Awesome. So let's go ahead and close out in prayer at your tables, and uh, we will see you again next time.